let's start talking about play. That's just an incredibly fun topic to talk about. Um, and you know, one of the things I love so much about play is that it's play, it's just, it makes you happy to talk about it, doesn't it? You know, just the word play, it sounds so good. But the thing about play is that it's, it's so fun, it's frolicsome, and it's really serious stuff. Because play has a huge impact both to the good and to the bad on our relationship with dogs. It has a relationship between people, has a relationship between children, has a relationship between parents and children, has a huge relationship between dogs and other dogs, and between your dog and you. And so it deserves a lot more attention than it's gotten. I'm really gratified that play is such a hot topic right now in dog training, because it should be, because it's a really important part of what we do. So I want to start by um, thanking some people who have very generously shared videotapes. We're going to watch a lot of videotapes of dogs playing, because one of the things I've learned doing, doing live dog demos is live dogs turn dead. When, when you get them on a stage and say, now play, play now, they're like, yeah, I don't do that on a stage. <laughs> so we have tons and tons of videos. And thanks to Dan Estep, Suzanne Hetz, Karen London, Pia Silvani, who very generously and graciously have shared videotapes that they have of appropriate and inappropriate dog play. We'll show a lot of that. First, I want to show a video that I did. And it's just, it's basically, I just want to get your brain starting to think about play. I want to just sort of see the fields um, and just get your brain starting to wrap around this huge, huge topic, because it's really a big, complicated, and interesting topic. So you're just going to start by seeing my Willie play with, who was one of his best friends, little Brody. And, and you know, it's, it's so fun to watch. It's so fun to watch dogs play. But what do we really know about it? You know, what do we know about play? And how can understanding it better help us improve our relationship? Well, we know a couple of things. We know that... <laughs> Look at who's playing here. Who plays most? Like, you don't need me to tell you, right? Look at how much the yous are playing. Eat, 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 eat. We also know that a lot of play is actually made up of actions that you see in other contexts. Like, these horses, are these horses fighting? Are these horses playing? Well, I think they're playing, but they're doing exactly what they do when they're fighting. Every single action you see these horses engage in are actions that you will see in the middle of a real fight. We don't know why animals play. Believe it or not, we're going to talk about this later. What is the function of play? There are um, suspicions, hypotheses, guesses that it has something to do with, with development, with developing motor coordination, with developing, I love watching these kids climb up here, with developing strength and motor coordination, with creating neural pathways between muscles and the brain. But we don't really know. We think that play also has something to do with social relationships. Here's Willie and little puppy Brody. And you see play most in highly social animals, especially predatory social mammals, and a lot of birds. You also see play at, at high levels in animals who, it's OK. <laughs> it's a happy seminar. But one of the distinguishing features of play is that the stronger, quicker one self-handicaps. I know. I know. And if this was your dog, how would you be? <laughs> but look at the dog, his mouth is open. You don't have to have a social partner to play. We know that dogs can play all by themselves. They don't need a friend to do it. Playful animals can make up games, as this dog of Chris Erickson seems to find a fine time doing. But play is often between members of a social group, and sometimes, in some species, it involves an object. And we're going to talk about this later, because object play is actually very rare. But it's most common in primates, and it's most common in humans, 
This is actually taped on the way to the zoo to tape playing animals early in the morning. And we sat down at the table and these little boys got out their little trucks and started object play, being classic primates, playing with objects. It's, imp it's important to remember, this is a little fuzzy because it's from YouTube, but it's important to remember that play is fun. <laughs> and let me, let me tell you a little bit about this last video of this little introductory sequence. Who you're going to see, um, you'll be able to hear, and we need to be sure the sound is really clear on this one, but who you're going to see is a neurobiologist named Jak Ponskap. Jak Panskap. Pan, pan or pan. Man's brilliant as far as I'm concerned. He wrote a book called Affective Neurobiology. If you're really into this topic, get it. It is not a beach read, but it's <laughs> fascinating. He has been doing work for over 20 years on emotion and neurobiology in non-human animals. So this guy is as rigorous a scientist as you get, right? People talk about like, well, it's not rocket science. Rocket science is just math, and math is just numbers. I'm sorry. It's just like big deal. Neurobiologists, I kiss the hem of their pants. I, you know, I mean, neurobiologists I consider to be just unbelievably impressive people in an unbelievably impressive field. So here's this rigorous, rigorous biologist who's going to tell you that rats giggle. Animals playing, we have heard what appeared to be the sounds of laughter. And uh, we studied these for a couple of years without quite understanding that this might be laughter. And then one day we decided to tickle some animals. And we realized that we had to look at the sounds at a very different register than we can hear. So we uh, obtained these transducers that are called bat detectors and that can bring very high frequencies down to our auditory range. And when we did this and we listened in, we could tickle animals and generate a lot of vocal activity that appeared to be laughter. These animals would begin to enjoy our company and they would start to play with our hands and wherever we would put our hands they would follow it. And when we tested these animals to ask whether they were enjoying this kind of activity the unambiguous answer was yes. So play is fun. But why? Why is play fun, and when is it not so fun anymore? That's pretty much what we're going to spend the rest of the afternoon talk about, talking about. So let's start by defining, we should always define our terms, let's start by defining play. Now, we all know what play is, right? I mean, we all know what play is. How many people Googled, oh, Gentle Touch is doing a seminar on play. Hmm, I don't know that word. <laughs> I'll look it up. I don't know what play, you know what play is, right? We all know what play is, but what if I asked you to define it? I mean, just think about it internally to yourself right now. What, how would you define play to an alien who said, like, I don't know the play. Explain the play to me. What would you say? Well, it's what? It's not so easy, is it? We all know what it is, but we don't know how to define it. So while you ponder that, how you would define play. You might play with that tonight, as a matter of fact, sort of a fun exercise. Um, obviously, there's some ways we can attempt to answer it. We'll work on that this afternoon. You can certainly go to the dictionary. The, one of the dictionary definitions is play, to occupy oneself in amusement, sport, or other recreation, i.e., children playing with toys. OK, that works for me. What if you're a biologist watching animals in the field? How would you decide that that definition would help you understand if an animal is fighting or playing or being predatory or mating or whatever? How, would you say, excuse me, are you amused? <laughs> you know, how do you know? How do you know? That definition works for people. But if you put yourself in the place of a biologist studying behavior, 
all of a sudden play gets really, really tricky. And I'll tell you, careers have been made and lost by people trying to understand play. It's a very difficult topic to study scientifically. Scientists have struggled with it for a very, very long time, partly because it's so hard to define. And one of the reasons it's so hard to define, as I said earlier, so many of the actions that you see in play, you see in other contexts. So it's not like there's unique things. You can say, oh, well, they only do that when they're playing. Because just about everything that animals do when they're playing, they do in another context, like being predatory or fighting. Some kind of intra-specific. Intra means within the same species. So dog-dog aggression is aggression between dogs. Um, intra-specific play has the same form as intra-specific aggression or agonistic behavior, some kind of social disagreement. Um, some, of, some of the actions you see, mounting in dogs, obviously, you also see in courtship and mating. So it's really tough. It's really hard to say, well, there's, these are things that you only see in play because you don't see anything that you just see in play with a few exceptions. Um, that actually dogs use, bless them, that, that uh, we'll learn later can help us out. So here's a definition by Mark Beckoff, who is a scientist who's been studying animal behavior for a long time. He's considered a specialist in play and emotions in non-human animals. Here's what he says, play. All motor activity that appears purposeless with motor patterns from other contexts, modified and altered. Keep that in mind, with motor patterns from other contexts, modified and altered. So let's think about that. Um, let's think about that while we look at what, even if it's hard to find a definition that's better than Dr. Beckhoff's, his, his is a pretty good one and it's accepted by the way, let's look at the criteria we can look at to decide if what we're watching is um, actually individuals playing or not. You're going to see, first of all, this is a video of Lassie and Willie when he was very young. And basically what you're seeing are animals engaging in behavior that you see in a whole different context. This kind of tug of war doesn't originate as a game. You see it when animals are eating and fighting for food. Basically, one predatory animal grabs a piece of meat, another puppy or animal or lion cub or wolf grabs the other piece of meat, and they grab it, and they start pulling it apart, trying to get more of it. They also grab pieces of food and shake to, sh to either kill the prey animal or to pull the meat off the bones. So out of context, out of context. You also see play actions that are triggered by stimuli that are different than the context in which you'd see it in predatory or agonistic encounters. Here's a little puppy of Chris Erickson's playing with a black plastic flower pot. I suspect that there is not a genetically mediated predisposition to play and put your head into a black plastic flower pot. I don't think that sort of is coded into the genes, but again, it's, it's behavior you see out of context triggered by different stimuli. Also, tends to be exaggerated. Remember Beckhoff's definition said um, actions that are out of context and exaggerated or seen sort of altered or modified. One of the ways to alter that is to exaggerate it. These, this is from this spring, April, from my farm. Um, and I'm just going to let it play for a little bit. I want you to watch these lambs and I want you to be Jane Goodall. I want you to watch the lambs and imagine, how would you write down what they're doing? How would you describe it to somebody else?
That little pinto buzz the entire time. Where's mommy? So keep thinking, how would you describe this? Besides terminally cute. <laughs> Self-initiated, like, yeah, like I call it popcorn play. They're just standing there and then boop, they pop up, you know? <laughs> um, Self-initiated, yeah, so self-initiated. I call it popcorn play. They just or stand there and then beep, they leap up. Um, there's another term that can be used to describe this, which, which was termed by two women, animal behaviorists, by the way, um, locomotor rotational play. Did you notice how, how their bodies rotated? There's a lot of lateral movement, and their bodies rotated a lot. So they went up, but they also went sideways. Um, and that's really typical. Locomotor rotational play. Kleiman and, wait, I have to look it up. Kleiman and Wilson. Locomotor rotational play. And you'll see it a lot, especially in ungulates. But you watch when we watch the dog video, videos. You'll, you'll see it again. A lot of lateral motion, a lot of rotational motion. This is our friend in the pool. Remember, Beckhoff's definition was lacking a definite purpose. I am unclear of the purpose, unless it's to empty the pool of water. Um, this is my definition. It's not actually normally included, but people ask me, how do you know? I say, no blood is a very good indicator. There's no blood here, therefore, presumably, things are going well. But besides, but the, the, the reason there's no blood, I know, it's like, eek. The reason there's no blood is because the polar bear is doing what's called self-handicapping. And we're going to talk a lot about self-handicapping because it is a vital and critical part of healthy play. Self-handicapping where the stronger and the faster one inhibits his, his or her abilities, um, damps them down to the level of a play partner so that, so that the play partner is not overwhelmed. It's a really important part. Let me show you an example. It's actually one of my favorite videos. I'm going to show you two videos of dogs self-handicapping. This is Willie, my now almost three-year-old, and he was probably 11 weeks or so when this was taken. Lassie would then have been 12 and a half, almost 13. And there are a couple of things, there are three things that go on here. One is self-handicapping, but just parenthetically, there are two other things that I think are fun that go on. One is that I believe, it's just a belief, I believe that Lassie is actively teaching Willie to play tug of war. You watch and tell me if you agree with me. And just parenthetically, active teaching has been argued to be unique to humans and only humans. And there's a big argument in the field that even like in chimpanzees, that individuals are not being actively taught, that there's a kind of a social facilitation, but there's no active teaching. I personally think this could be a great example of active teaching. I think she's trying to teach him to play. But then she also tells him when she's done playing. And it's a wonderful signal. So here we go. So most important to the self-handicapping, watch how slowly she shakes her head and how she dampens the arc. You know, she can, she can play tug of war at that age with the best of them. She could rip that thing out of his mouth in a second. And when she does, look what she does. She gives it right back to him. She gives it right back, and then she doesn't shake as hard. See how she slowed? And, and decrease the arc of, of shaking? Jim. This is me. Jim, turn the television down. Jim, turn the television down. <laughs> so like, back we go. So she pulls it away, then she gives it to him again to take. Now. I'm done now. Look at her. See, she, see her go still? She just said, I'm done playing. I don't want to play anymore. 
I'm going to suck on my toy. I'm not interested in playing. And apparently, he's a young little puppy, and he didn't understand that, so she's going to make it <laughs> more clear. And look at this head turn. Did you hear me? And he did. Right? Dogs read dogs, right? Nobody can read a dog like a dog. Okay, that was Lassie, the stronger, bigger one, self-handicapping. Watch this video two years later. Lassie is now 15. Willie is over two. Willie, by the way, can rip my arm out of my shoulder socket. This is the strongest, fastest border collie I have ever had. I say that on the grave of Luke. My soulmate, one in a million dog, Willie, is crazy and the fastest dog and the strongest dog I've ever had. Watch him play with old 15-year-old Lassie. He completely and totally changes the way he's playing tug. He almost, she shakes, he doesn't. He's pulling backwards straight. When he plays with me, he shakes his head so hard I can barely hang on. He is completely self-handicapping. She's now weaker, he's now stronger. That's her barking, by the way. All he does is pull straight back. She shakes, he doesn't. How sweet is that? Right? So handicapping is done by the stronger one. Okay. We're going to talk a lot about the dark side of play. Um, <laughs> And one of the dark side of play is, is the problem of over-arousal. I think that's one of the biggest problems with play between dogs and one of the biggest problems with play between people and dogs. We'll talk a lot more about that. Um, so, so keep that in mind because I think it's a really important issue. And if there's anything you take out of this seminar, it's going to be how, to, how important it is to focus on arousal, how to prevent it from becoming over-arousal. Um, and what to do about it if that happens. So going back to what we know about play, this is obvious to all of us. We all know that high levels of play are not often seen in adults. I live in Wisconsin. You see a lot of this. <laughs> don't see a lot of cows playing. You will see it on occasion. I'm not saying you don't ever. Um, and there are certain species in which you see high levels of play in adults. The two most common, mm, people and dogs. And my hypothesis that I talked about in For the Love of a Dog, I truly believe one of the reasons we have this absurd bond, our bond with dogs is a biological phenomenon that deserves way more attention from biologists and sociologists and psychologists. People, risk their, people die to save their dog's life. Dogs die to save people's lives. You guys, they're different species. Like, we don't, you know, you know that, right? <laughs> To risk your life for a member of another species, it ain't like you're going to pass those genes on. You know? This is amazing. There's, there's something that's going on that deserves more attention. I think part of it is our shared love of play. Because we love to play as adults. Um, and there are other mammals that do, certainly. River otters are famous. Wolves can be very playful. There are other animals that do, but at the levels that we do it, it's not particularly common. Um, and here's proof of that. Remember the video I had of the little boys playing with the trucks at the restaurant on my way to the zoo? Well, we went to the zoo really early in the morning, got in specially, because I know the primate head caretaker. We got in early, early, early before anybody else was there because I wanted to be there early in the morning when the animals were playful, <laughs> right? So here are the playful animals. Now, you well might say, and this would be a good criticism, yeah, but you're in a zoo. These are captive animals. I've been to Africa three times. I'm going in two weeks, by the way, one more time. There's still room. <laughs> There's room for just a few more people. Um, I've also seen wild bears quite a bit. Watched them in Denali. The baby cubs played, the mothers ate, or did this. I've seen primates in the wild in the field in Kenya and Tanzania. 
And chimps play at higher rates than a lot of adult mammals, but nothing like what their youngsters do. Young chimpanzees play tremendously. Um, you might want to turn the sound down a little bit here, because I want to focus on these unbelievably oxytocin-producing cute little creatures here. <laughs> prairie dogs. Um, Roly-poly prairie dogs. And here they are, playing away. <laughs> Early in the morning, animals groom, they feed, they find food, they sleep. That's mostly what adults do. Her colobus monkeys, again, at the zoo. Here's the flamingos at the zoo. I've seen all these animals in the wild. Every one of them, mostly, this is what they do. You know, they save themselves from being eaten by something else. They feed, they rest, they groom. Every once in a while, once a year, they mate. That's pretty much it. But their babies play. Play in adults is most common in predatory mammals. Well, even in the young, you see really high rates of play in predatory mammals and birds. It's, it's really quite rare. There's a wonderful book about pronghorn antelope. Those of you who live in the West probably have seen them quite a bit. Pronghorn antelope are local African-looking like antelope here that lives in the American West, um, mostly Wyoming, um, Montana. John Byers has been studying them for pretty much all of his life, and he says if you miss one week of field work, one week of field work, you have missed 15% of all the play you're going to see for the entire year in that species. One week. That's how rarely they play. Pretty much when they grow up, they don't play anymore. They're busy. Object play is especially rare. You just don't see it very often. In a lot of species, you see sex differences in play, and this is really fun for those of us who love dogs. Object, uh, sex differences are extreme in some species, including our own, and including higher apes, or apes, higher primates like chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and to some extent baboons. Yeah, no, I know it's true in baboons. Um, don't know some of the other primates, but I know it's true with them. Sex differences in play styles are so different that, that researchers actually will use play as an indicator of sex. Say you're watching a troop of baboons or you're watching a troop of chimpanzees and you haven't yet identified. It's not always that easy, you know. You're a long way away, you're watching, it's like, you know, does he, you know, are there any or not, you know. It's not that easy all the time, right? It's like, can you see? I don't know. You watch him play. There's a kind of play called rough and tumble play. Rough and tumble play. Who does it most? Males. Yeah, right, males. It's like you didn't know, like we all know. Everybody knows this, um, especially dog trainers. Because who mostly wants to do rough and tumble wrestle play with their dog? Man. And don't you feel like a witch when you sit there and say, I'm sorry. I just strongly advise you don't get on the ground and wrestle play with your dog like that, right? <laughs> You know, and usually the woman of the couple is like, I told him. <laughs> and the guy is like, but it's so much fun. And it is, it is fun. It just can lead to trouble. And we'll talk about why I think people should do it. So historically, it's been argued that there are sex differences in play in primates, some other species, humans, but not dogs. But wait, but wait, you're going to be among the first to know. That's not true. One of the biggest issues about play, I would argue, this is me talking here, is that play, play has not received what I would call the respect and the attention and the interest from people studying behavior, from psychologists, from anthropologists, to ethologists. I don't think it's, just, it's gotten the attention that it deserves. Um, an example, when I was working on this seminar, I went to two of my favorite textbooks. One is Animal Behavior. I might not have those in your references, so you might want to jot it down. Animal Behavior by John Alcock, A-L-C-O-C-K. He's a noted ethologist. He's, this is basically the text that's used pretty much by probably 80% of the animal behavior ethology, zoology-oriented classes, John Alcock's Animal Behavior. One of my other favorite textbooks is just titled Psychology. It's the intro psych book written by David Myers, M-Y-E-R-S, David Myers. I went to the index. Play isn't in the index. 
in a book on animal behavior and a book on psychology. Everything about development, everything about neurobiology, everything about emotions and physiology and behavior, mating, courtship, linguistics, cognition, nothing on play. And, and as I say that, I honestly, I'm so astounded by that, I'm thinking like, is that really true? Should I go look again? Maybe that's wrong. How could that be? I did look again, you guys. It's true. It's just amazing. And so here's my hypothesis. I don't think play has gotten the attention and the respect that it's deserved. One, because it's really hard to define. And it's, it's not, people literally have like ripped their hair out in hunks trying to define play. Because you're sitting watching wild animals, you're going like, is that play? It's like, I don't know. You know, I think it is. But how would I write it down so somebody else would know? But I think mostly it's also something that, as we said, is done mostly by the young. And I think there's a kind of a gravitas that goes along with, ooh, aggression, territorial aggression, mating, sex, ooh, male dominance, ooh, sexy, cool, play, ah, you know, kids do it. It's just not cool. You know, there's not a drama in it. It's just not cool. Well, it should be, because it's really, really important. And that's changing. As it's changing in dog training, it's changing in science as well. Starting to see more and more and more of it talked about. Even though it may not be getting a lot of attention, and I don't, I don't want to misrepresent it. It's not like nobody's studying it. There are some great textbooks out. There are some great academic books on play out there. Beckhoff wrote some. Byers wrote some. There's some great books out there. It's not that there's nothing out there. Um, and you do have some of those references in your handouts. But one of the arguments by people who do study play is that even though we don't know what the function is, it's got to be important because, first of all, if you prevent healthy animals from doing it, they make, they make ways up to do it. They're animals who are predisposed to play. It's very hard to stop them from doing it unless you raise them in circumstances that makes them literally crazy, like, like raising a dog on a chain in a barn in the dark. You know, they, they, those dogs, I've seen way too many of them, and I'll tell you, they never learn object play during this, what I think is a critical period, and they can learn it eventually if you can get them and rehab them. It also often takes them one to two to three years to have any interest in an object. Um, we know that animals will search for play partners in, in certain circumstances, and most importantly, play is dangerous. Animals get hurt doing it. We all know, look how many sports medicine clinics there are. Look how many sports medicine vets there are now. There's a sports medicine veterinary clinic in Madison, Wisconsin. He's, a, you know, he's, Willie has a sports med vet, you know? So it's dangerous. Animals get hurt, makes them attract attention for, um, for predators but it's persistent. So there's got to be a function. There's got to be a reason that animals play. So I'm not going to talk too long about this because I want to start talking about dogs playing. But, but just to go through this really briefly, just so you know, there are a lot of hypotheses of now about why animals play. And it seems so simple. It's like, well, sure, they play to learn to use their muscles and to get better motor coordination. But the fact is, it's we, we really don't know, and the research is not definitive. There are some studies in which you prevent animals from playing and then put them back together in a situation in which they can play, and it appears that they do have a kind of a play deficit, you know, or some kind of a motor coordination deficit. There are other species you do that with. You stop little rats from playing, and then you finally give them a chance to play. They play as if they've been practicing every day. They play exactly like they did, even if you raise them in isolation for X amount of time. So, eh, you know, we don't really know that the, one of the most reasonable hypotheses is not just about sort of muscles and motor coordination. It's, it's about creating neural channels between the muscles and the motor cortex of the brain to help individuals basically figure out um, how to move their body and have free channels that allow their muscles to, to um, communicate with the motor cortex of their brain. So play has a lot of movement and a lot of action to it. It's got to have some important developmental role. I mean, there's just no question about it. There's a reason that kids do it. One, 
one, one of the interesting, and it's sort, of a, it's, it's, it's sort of a hot hypothesis right now that's getting a lot of attention. One of the hypotheses of the function of play is that, is that it's beyond just giving an individual sort of a motor pathway between the muscles in their brain and physical experience about the world, but it's specifically preparation for the unexpected. Remember those little lambs just beep, just leaping out of nowhere, beep. One of the sort of hot hypotheses is that this plays a way of wiring the brain and the muscles to allow an individual to react instantly to something unexpected. Because so much of what happens in play is unpredictable. Um, so here's a video. I actually took this from YouTube. But this is just an example of the importance of being prepared. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Just never know. Okay. Okay. Here's now an, another parallel hypothesis, not, necess not necessarily competing. There doesn't have to be one function to play. There can be several, right? One, one of the potentials or potential benefits of playing, especially in social animals, is that you can get information about others. This is what you're going to see is an introduction of two dogs. This is Lassie again. I'm sorry, there's a lot of Lassie and Willie because, you know, that's who I have. Um, but this is Sydney at the, this age, I think he was about 10 months old. He never met Lassie before. So I want you to watch his behavior and think about it in terms of learning about Lassie. What happens if I do this? What if I do this? I could try this. How about this? <laughs> what you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do if I do this? What you gonna do if I do that? Um, so that's an interesting hypothesis. There's also a lot of discussions about the role of social status and play, and play to help determine or clarify social status. Now, one of the things that I actually spend a long time talking about when, when, when I talk about dog-dog um, aggression within the home is this whole concept of status and dominance, the D word. Um, <laughs> The D word is so controversial, actually a behaviorist, Wayne Hunthausen and I came up with the concept formally described as, um, <laughs> as dominance, and we actually made up a symbol. Remember when Prince had a symbol? Um, because you could, that word is so misused. And, and I know it's really controversial about whether dogs, what kind of social systems dogs have, but I have to tell you, whatever word you use, I use social status, it's almost, it's impossible for me to explain the behavior of dogs, one tail up, one tail down, without accepting that there's some kind of social hierarchy, some kind of social status between dogs. I think actually that's partly why when they greet each other, they get along so well, and cats don't. Cats do not have a similar social hierarchy to dogs, so you don't see one tail up and one tail down. I'm not saying one cat's not more special than another, but they don't have a similar social hierarchy. So one of the things we know that a lot about play is about winning, but then self-handicapping. It's true of people, it's true with dogs, it's true with horses. It's like, I can be the one to bite you, but I won't. I can be the one to wrestle you and pin you to the ground, but I won't hurt you. That's where the self-handicapping comes in. But individuals like to win. Winning is, you know, to be the one who sort of wins and has the advantage. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about how that might relate to social status. Here's a, here's a video, pretty fuzzy, but I just love it. I just love it. Little darling baby miniature foals. It's like, yeah, not so darling. <laughs> um, watch. Watch these interactions between these little tiny miniature horses in which one horse is clear. All horses are equal, but one horse is more equal than others. Um, 
So there's another, watch the Pinto. Bee! Now I'm going to kick you. Now I'm going to chase after you. I win, I win, I win. Right? You've all seen bullies on the playground. Um, happens in dogs too. So I want to go through types of play. Then we're going to take a little break and we're going to talk about intraspecific play between dogs and show you lots of videos. Talk about what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. So just think about these types of play as, as we go through these. Obviously we know there's social play. We talked a lot about that. Very common in social animals like dogs and chimpanzees. Social play involves play fighting like the polar bear um, and these two eskies playing. Uh, wrestle play, rough and tumble wrestle play is extremely common. Cats, dogs, primates. Don't see a lot of that in ungulates. Hoofed animals, don't see a lot of sheep down on the ground wrestling each other. <laughs> don't see a lot of cows doing that. Don't see a lot of horses doing that. Predators, predators play rough and tumble rest of play. Prey animals do not. Interesting distinction. I made this term up. I've never seen anything ever called pounce play in my life. But nonetheless, when I was looking at videos and pictures, I just kept finding picture after picture after picture of one animal pouncing onto another. It's actually in rats, a pounce is the equivalent of a play bow. So it's, it's the initiation of a play bow is a pounce. So somebody uses the word pounce out there. Obviously, we know dogs love to chase. A lot of them chase play is extremely common. And so is object play, that rare quantity you don't see in too many animals, but you see at very high levels in dogs and people. Um, and I just, you know, just take the perspective of, of a biologist for a minute, because we don't think about it very much. But I have to tell you, watch the news tonight. I want you to time how much time in the valuable, valuable news show, they're only about 22 minutes when you take out the ads, 20 to 22 minutes in a half hour news show, I want you to time how many minutes are spent on world peace, the economy, Iran, Iraq, politics, fires, danger, and how much is spent on the fate of a golf ball, a tennis ball, a basketball, a football, a soccer ball. <laughs> it's equal. That's sort of crazy. <laughs> I would suggest to you that's an obsession. Okay, and it's an obsession we share with dogs. It's relatively rare in the animal world. Um, for people who sell dog toys, this is a disheartening video. I know you can make a lot of money selling dog toys. <laughs> but they don't actually need them. Although, don't get me wrong, I love dog toys. I have a bunch of them. I'm having so much fun with my pieces of dried grass. <laughs> I don't need anything else but my dried grass. And see how you're seeing that predatory, see, rip, shake, fall, <laughs> fall. Here's Willie. Here's Willie basically killing the rope toy. Oh, kill it. Kill it, kill it, kill it. Shake, 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 shake. Oh, I'm going to kill it. Oh, die, die. Oh, you guys, this is an otter. And, and what I want you to, s can't see it yet, but right, watch this area right here. Because there's a little tiny nut that this otter balances back and forth <laughs> from arm to arm across his or her chest. <laughs> Watch it in slow mo. They're giving them something to do. It's like a pony. Wee! Wee! Here are they're about four and a half week old Sheltie puppies. And this is very typical of this age. First, we're starting sort of on object play. A little object. Oh, shake. Oh, shake, rip. Mm. Oh, mount. 
Oh, now I'm going to do some mounting. Yeah, now nice squish mount. No, I'm going to get on top of you. I want on top. I want on top. Bite. Now I'm going to bite you. This is the opposite of the dried grass. Have you seen it? The opposite of the dried grasses. This is the ultimate Rube Goldberg device. You could throw the tennis ball or you could spend hours building a device. Yes, indeedy. This is on YouTube, but you can find it on YouTube. Just Google it. So the dog has learned, put it in here, and they get ready to go. Whee! Come back. And watch how carefully the dog's like, oh, I won't play. I love my ball. I love my ball. Ball, 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 and my ball. Oh, my ball. Okay. Oh, 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 it's so hard to get in there. Oh, no, oh, too fast. So, so the, the, the creator of this has to do this by hand. He's moving it up and down manually. He could all just throw the ball. And here again, we have our little puppy with this expensive dog toy. Putting dog toy company business out of business, basically. And in we go. In we go. OK. Object play can be social um, between animals. Object play can be solitary. <laughs> Some dogs play by themselves more than others. I'm really lucky. Willie has very high energy and a lot of play drive. I'm crazy about the word drive, but basically he's motivated to play a lot. And if I'm tired or busy and I say, Willie, that's enough, he will go play by himself. So it's great to have dogs who are solitary players. They just come that way, you guys. Um, now, you can, you can sort of train one the wrong way, so it is always dependent on you. But, but when Willie was a puppy, when he was seven weeks old, he'd go play by himself. They just sort of come that way or not. You can shape it, um, or you can teach it. Nobody taught Sydney to play this game. Which <laughs> Which is the poke your nose in the whole game. <laughs> and if anybody knows why, he pokes his nose in the holes. Because <laughs> we don't know. We don't know why he does it. Okay. Let's, I'll tell you what. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to make a decision. We have, as I mentioned, we have three sections. There's the, the intro about the biology of play. There's a section on dog-dog play. There's a section on human-dog play. What I think would be best is to have two short breaks in between the three sections. All right. Okay. Let's start talking. Let's start applying this. It's all interesting foundation information, but let's start applying it specifically to dogs. And let's talk about intraspecific play, um, dog dog play. So, one of the first things I can tell you is that we don't know much. <laughs> we know shockingly little about canine behavior of canine, canis familiaris, canis lupus familiaris. We, it's just amazing how little research there actually has been done on domestic dogs. I am happy to say that's starting to change, but nonetheless, there's very little. I think all of you know of the classic Scott and Fuller work that was done on the development of behavior. I should tell you, a lot of that work would never be published now. It's very old. It's a wonderful, wonderful, invaluable resource. Um, and it's one of the resources in which we found that play, in general, Social and what they call sexual play begins around three weeks of age, right around when dogs are, you know, they can start to hear around two and a half weeks of age. Their eyes are starting to, 
to um, get a little bit more resolution in them. They can see a little better. Um, their auditory nerve is connecting to their brain, and they start getting a little bit of motor coordination. Um, first thing they do, I can tell you from watching, is that they back up. Anybody else raise litters? And notice the first thing that litters do is they back up. They have reverse before they have forward. Um, it's pretty cute. But so here's the good news, is just recently, people are actually starting to do some really interesting good research on dogs. I've been advocating for this for 22 years, and it's so gratifying to see it actually start to happen. So I'm going to be able to talk to you about some of it, including the fact um, that from Barbara Smuts's lab, Barbara Smuts is in Michigan. She's had several graduate students doing their dissertations on play and domestic dogs. There's some great stuff that's come out of there. One of the things that she found, that if you think about it, is not a surprise to any of us, is that even if you have 10 dogs together, or five dogs, or 30 dogs, who plays together? Two dogs. Most play is between what, what biologists call a dyad, between two individuals. Most play is between two dogs. And I think it's something we need to think about. Those of us with daycares, I know there's some people here with daycares. I know a lot of you have puppy classes. Something we need to think about when we put a big group of dogs together in a room is that the way dogs naturally play together is two dogs play together. And I think it's important for us to give ch dogs chances to do that. When you get, when you get, I'm not saying you shouldn't have a big group of dogs together. I mean, I think in many circumstances it can be absolutely a wonderful thing to do for certain dogs. Some dogs can't handle it, some dogs can. But do pay attention to how those dogs in those groups are playing. Usually, if there's a third dog, and, and um, Bauer, Erica Bauer and Smuts looked at this, they looked at what they called interventions. You have two dogs playing together, and then a third dog comes up. Not 100% of the time, but, but the vast majority of the time, that third dog goes to the dog who's underneath who's not, you know, say they're doing rough and tumble wrestle play, and one dog is on its back and one dog is standing over. The third dog comes in and directs his or her attention to the dog underneath in sort of, quote, loser. I, I mean that metaphorically, you know what I mean? In that position, very, very sort of interesting, almost, well, very rarely does that dog go and sort of grab at the attention of another dog. It does happen, but it's not as common. But I want to talk to you about more things that we know just from the last five years, four or five years of research that comes out of the Barbara Smuts's lab. Camille Ward, uh, who's, who's done just a beautiful piece of work on play and development in the domestic dog. She's got her PhD last year, by the way. What, what she and um, Erica Bauer and Barbara Smuts looked at was, was several things. One, one was what they call preferred partner preferences, PPP, preferred partner preference. And what they were looking at was over time is, is do dogs initially or eventually seem to prefer playing with one, one other partner rather than the other. They looked at four litters um, and they couldn't track all the litters all the way through time and space. So you can see that the total sample size, they start with 19 puppies all the way through, I think it's 40 weeks, by that time they only have six puffies left. So most of their work was actually done in these very early, early weeks. But what they found is even though the sample size is small, it seemed to be quite consistent. What they found was early in play, and these are between litter mates now, early in play, dogs, puppies played with anybody. As they got older and older and older, and these dogs were sent to homes and were brought back once a week or once a month to play with each other, as they got older, they started picking preferred partners, such that only one of 19 puppies seemed to direct their attention to another puppy. Um, it was sort of all over the map, didn't matter who was who. By the time the, the dogs got this age, every puppy had a preferred partner and played at much higher rates with that other partner than they did with other puppies of the litter. And one of the things that Dr. Ward argues, and I think this is a really interesting point, is, and Barbara Smuts talks about this, is how important friends are, how important buddies are to dogs. And I think it's something we don't think about too often. Our dogs so often have to deal with unfamiliar dogs. 
constantly. And I'm not sure that's always such a good thing. I mean, think about, and I'm being anthropomorphic here, but I think sometimes I would argue to you being anthropomorphic is actually useful. Um, as a matter of fact, in my experience, people are not anthropomorphic when they should be. It's like, of course your dog is scared now. Wouldn't you be scared now? You know, but then they're, then they're anthropomorphic when they shouldn't be. Like, I know he peed on the couch because he's mad. Because I left him and I went to work. It's like, yeah, your dog expected you to have a trust fund, you know, and he's angry because his friend down the street has a rich owner who doesn't have to work during the day? I don't think so, you know? You know, I just, I, I don't think dogs often do what we, what we attribute to them, but then often we tend to not, not put ourselves in their place and imagine in a way that's constructive the way they may be feeling. And I think being constantly overwhelmed with unfamiliar dogs is very difficult for dogs. And I, I, I don't really know what to say about how important it is for a dog to have a buddy, a familiar friend that he lives, he or she lives with all the rest of their lives. Willie's best friend moved to Florida. Bro, uh, Brody, that little puppy you saw him playing with, he's gone. You know, and I feel really badly I haven't found a replacement yet. So, but I think it's something to think about that we don't think about as often as we might. So, remember I said that historically, traditionally, we have been told that there are no sex differences in play in dogs? Uh, 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 uh. Not true. Look at what they found. When Camille Ward and Barbara Smuts looked at sex differences in play, they found some really interesting things. First of all, they found that males initiate play more than females, which, by the way, is ubiquitous among mammals. Males, especially predatory kinds, especially chimpanzees, humans. How many of you have had children, both, both girls and boys? Not, not a lot. <laughs> or else you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. <laughs> I didn't know it was private. <laughs> um, but, I mean, we all know. I mean, who plays more? You know, it's boys. It's little boys. We all know that. They have much higher energy levels, much higher sort of play frequency, much more intense play. True of primates, it's true of rhesus macaques, it's true of chimpanzees, it's true of gorillas, it's true of baboons. Males play and initiate play more than females do. If you look at mixed sex partners, so we're back to that diet again, there's, there, are two dogs, there are two dogs, two puppies playing. They found that males initiate play with females far more than females initiate play with males. This is also true in primates, also true in other species. Males want to play with everybody. Females don't always want to play with males as much as males want to play with females. I didn't plan to say it that way. <laughs> but I sort of like the way it came out. Um, they also found that males self-handicap more they're playing with females than they play with other males, which makes sense because the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not is in general males tend to be stronger than females. It's just what it is. So they also found if they're the same sex partners, so not, not male and female playing together, but female, female, SSP, same sex partners playing, first of all, that became more and more common. Males played with males, females played with females. So again, this is the litter, and they're coming back together once a month um, as they get older and older and older. And as they got older, you got more females play with females, males play with males. This is something I had never noticed. I had never noticed this, you know, paying attention. How often do you actually pay attention unless there's trouble? It's like, well, was it two females? Well, no wonder, <laughs> you know, right? You know? Um, they also found, just as you would suspect from the previous slide, that females displayed a strong preference to play with other females, to not play with males. And as the males got older, something happened is they stopped trying to initiate play with females as often and initiated play with males at a higher frequency. So there are sex differences, at least in who wants to play with who. Let me go back to what's called the 50-50 rule. 50-50 rule is something you see all over biology. You also see it all over books talking about dog play. I don't know how many times I've read this. 
in books that I respect greatly, that, that healthy play is characterized by dogs reverse, alternating roles and, and doing it about 50-50. So, you know, one dog is on top half the time and the other do dog is on top half the time. There, there are zoologists who propose that healthy play is always characterized by the 50-50 rule. But basically, within, you know, obviously a couple of percentage points, you expect to, see, expect to see healthy play partners alternating relatively symmetrically who does what to who. So what Warden Smuts did is they characterized like good ethologists they watched play, they characterized it, they observed it, they recorded it, they carefully made sure that they had inter-observer reliability so that everybody agreed what a bite shake was, everybody agreed what a chase was, and they recorded the instance of it. So they're, they're pretty obvious. They, they titled some of these categories or some of these actions um, on offense, um, bite shake, chase, ch uh, being the one who does the chasing. Um, chin over, a force down where one dog took his body or her body in some way and actually moved his or her body in such a way that the other individual pretty much had no choice but to lie down. Um, a mount, a muzzle bite, or an entire body over. So there's a chin over, there's actually a leg over, or an entire body over. What they called self-handicapping, I'm not, it probably is not the title label that I would use. But, but they talked about muzzle lick, so licking the muzzle of another dog, and a voluntary down, in which an animal lies down without any influence, observable anyway, not, certainly not physically forced in any way by the other. And then, of course, they, rec they recorded play bows. So again, they're testing this 50-50 rule. And what they found was that dogs do not even begin to adhere to the 50-50 rule, even in what appears to be perfectly healthy play. As a matter of fact, as they got older, their play became less symmetrical. So, so what happened was, just to use a quick um, symbol, what, what you could call the top dog, meaning the one who was standing over, chin over, on offense, and not, not offense as in aggression, just the sort of the actor, the initiator, the one on top, the one doing the chasing. Um, the lowest ratio, they never got to 50-50. The lowest ratio they got was like 60-40. So one dog was on top or the winner 60% of the time, where the other partner in the dyad was 40% of the time. That was the lowest ratio they got. There were some dogs who were 100% the only ones who did the mounting, the only ones who did the chasing, the only ones who were on top. So dogs don't, so when you read that dogs are supposed to alternate, well, they don't. Well, they don't. Yes. Oh, oh wait, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? No, wait. <laughs> Do you have a question? <laughs> We need to get it on the microphone. So yes, do you have a question? How did, how did they set the criteria for what they called healthy play? I mean, when Oh, that was my word, okay? That was, that was my word. Basically, none of these things ever ended up in fights. Um, so I actually use the word healthy play, okay? Um, yeah, and, and I mean, I've seen some of the videos, and it may be, I mean, you're, you're her point is actually a really good one. It could be that you and I would watch some of those videos when the dogs were older and go like, ooh, I don't know, you know? So, so I didn't see all the videos. So what I can tell you is from talking to Dr. Ward, talking to Cam Camille, is there seemed to be, and you'll see a video, of situations in which in, in dogs seem to be playing um, with, with both dogs equally willing, both dogs uh, initiating play, sort of starting the sequence up, both dogs look relaxed, no dog tries to stop it, appears to be, appears to, now, is that true in every single case? I can't tell you that. Okay, so let me, let me just clarify this a little bit more, and then if you have more questions, we can get to that. Because I think some of this is really, really interesting, that the dogs who initiated play, so they, they recorded who started the play sequence, who started the play bout, were the dogs who were most Commonly, the dogs who were standing over, who were the dogs who were mounting, who were the dogs who were doing body over or chin over or, or in some way on, quote, offense, the initiator, um, the asserter, if you will. And, and one, of the, one of the arguments by some people is, is that we talked earlier about play is about 
getting yourself often in a situation in which you win, but you don't take advantage of it. That's what self-handicapping is. You get the other animal on the ground where you could hurt them, but you don't. And if you think about most of our play, isn't there a winner and a loser? You know, all those balls running around in holes and hoops and, you know, there's a winner and there's a loser. There is. Look at almost all the play we do. It's very rare that somebody doesn't win and somebody doesn't lose. And we just put boundaries on it and we put rules on it. And we make a really big deal of who wins. Have you ever thought about the absurdity of getting $4 million for getting a little round white thing in a hole in the ground? <laughs> I have to tell you, I love watching golf. I couldn't play it if my life depended on it, but I actually like watching it, but it's crazy. <laughs> it's absurd. There's a winner. There's a winner. So one of the potentials is that animals who get to be in the on-top position initiate it most because it's most fun for them. You know? If you're really good at golf, aren't you going to play more? And what does really good at golf mean? It means getting the hole in the ball more than somebody else does, partly, right? So they found, as, as we said earlier, that some dogs did 100% of on offense behavior in any given dyad. And, and, and I love this, there was, there was a correlation between a high rate of self-handicapping and a high rate of doing a play bow. So dogs who did a lot of play bows would do a voluntary down, for example. And you'll see some really nice examples of this. They did see role reversals. Remember, we talked about, you'll, you'll read in some literature that healthy play, appropriate play, you see dogs reversing roles all the time. And look at what they found. I find this really interesting. They found, they did find role reversals. So you've got, you got two animals playing. And this is not just puppies, by the way. This is also adults, a different data set, dog parks, etc. You saw, they saw, Quite a bit of reversals. The most common reversals were during pushing. One dog sort of uses his body to push another. Tackles, sort of that kind of pounce play I talked about, and chases. Those roles reversed relatively commonly. There were no role reversals. Once dogs, once dogs were mature, there were no role reversals for mounts. So if dog A mounted dog B, dog B did not mount dog A. This is in play. There were no reversals in receiving muzzle bites, and there were no reversals in giving muzzle licks. So if you're interested in relationships between two dogs, pay attention to these categories. They're written in your handouts. Go to a dog park, watch dogs play, and pay attention to this, because I think it's potentially really significant. By the way, talked about there being no sex effect. There was no sex effect which supports this tradition of no differences in sex play in dogs. There was no difference in the type of play, which is not true of primates, and no difference in role, rever role reversals based on sex. So who plays with who was highly sex dependent, but exactly how they play um, did not, was not necessarily dependent on who they are. So rough and tumble play is just as common, or wrestle play basically in dogs, in males and females, unlike in primates. So we have a question back there. Is there a um, correlation between the dogs that mount and the dogs that give muzzle bites versus, I mean, in other words, does the same dog mount as gives muzzle bites and then the other dog is the one who does the muzzle That's licks? That's a really good question. It's not actually in their paper. I can ask her, wouldn't we all probably guess? Yes. But I don't know. I don't think that's actually the data that's presented in the paper. Papers are very specific and very short. It's a very good question. My guess is yes, but we're all guessing, right? Wouldn't you think yes, maybe? Good question. We have one more question. Um, and she's going to ask it when the microphone comes. Good girl. Did it make a difference if the dogs were of the same breed or different breeds uh, in their no. play? No. No, and, and at least not in terms of role reversals. What I would say, and I'm not going to talk about it too much, but I think I'm really glad you mentioned that. We know that different breeds play differently. I have seen no research on this, though, and, and th there are so many PhDs waiting to happen. <laughs> I'm serious. I've got to tell you, Camille Ward partly did this PhD because I met her 15 years ago and she wanted to be an applied animal behaviorist. 
and she had already done really good research on crows or raven behavior. And I said, why don't you go back to school and do research? We're desperate. We are desperate for good research on domestic dogs. And she did, and she got a PhD. Annika Lisberg switched from beetle taxonomy. <laughs> no kidding. Beetle taxonomy. She was my teaching assistant at a class at the university. She took my class. She went, wow, this is really interesting stuff. I'm going to stop drawing beetles that are a quarter of an inch high. <laughs> and I'm going to study dog behavior. And she went back to graduate school. She switched from entomology to zoan psychology. I was on a committee, and she did a research on scent marking. And I cannot, if I died tomorrow, I would feel good about having a tiny, tiny, tiny little impact on helping to inspire that research. Any of you who are out there, if you're thinking about it, the field is desperate for really good, rigorous research. It's desperate for it. And if you want to do it, it's just out there waiting like a plum to be picked. Is it easy? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Is it necessarily and needed? Yes. I mean, aren't you loving this? Isn't this so cool that somebody's done this? But it just raises lots more questions. So I would love to see somebody do research on what I think all of us anecdotally believe which is there are profound differences in play. Bully breeds play really physical, a lot of body slamming. Um, a lot of field labs play the same way. You get a bunch of field labs playing with like a super sensitive border collie, and you pretty much have a mess, <laughs> you know, right? You get a bunch of border collies playing um, chasey chasey, snappy snappy, you know, bitey bitey in the wrong context, and you've got trouble. I think there are big differences in play that are both individual and breed specific. So I would love to see more research on it. So one of the suggestions of this research is that, is that healthy play does not necessarily require players to switch roles. Does that mean all play in which roles are not switched is healthy? No. No, it does not. I'll show you some that's not, as a matter of fact. But it doesn't require it, not necessarily. Before we look at videos, let me show you, uh, or let me talk about one of the most interesting aspects of canine play, which is the play bow. We all know it. Of course we know it, right? It's the most easily identifiable signal from a dog to another dog or a person, and it is unique. There are actually very few species that have a signal as clear as dogs. These play bows, you're talking about different play styles? No, there's no breed-related play style with a play bow. All dogs play bow the same way, and all canids who play bow play bow exactly the same way. It's the most stereotyped, consistent, and universally given signal that we, that we know of in play with animals who are social players. It's really, it's an amazing thing. I don't need to describe it to you. You know exactly what it looks like, right? Um, it's always head down, it's always hindquarters up, um, and, and we know some really interesting things about it. We know that it is given most often in situations in which play could be misinterpreted or an action could be misinterpreted. It's, it's, um, it's most frequently given, and this is partly from Beckhoff's work, it is most frequently given between dogs who don't know each other to initiate play or during a play bout, in the middle of a play bout before biting, body slamming, or, or bite shaking. And what we think is that this is a classic example of what's called metacommunication. And metacommunication is communication about communication. So basically what metacommunication means is I'm going to tell you something about something I'm going to tell you. <laughs> And what we think the play bow means, and I think all of you probably agree, is what play bow means is everything about to follow, it's just a joke. <laughs> just because I'm doing what I would do when we're fighting, or having sex, <laughs> or killing something, doesn't mean that's what it means. It's metacommunication. It's communication about communication. Take everything under that's about to happen, under the auspices of, I don't really mean it. And this is why that's important. <laughs> they have carpet knives in their mouths. And they open elk hides with them. 
I want you to imagine how many people have a leather purse, a leather bag, leather backpack, leather anything. Have you ever tried to open it with your mouth? <laughs> no, not so easy. Your dog can do it like that, right? Just like that. Trivial for your dog. They have carpet knives in their mouth. They can kill each other. They can hurt each other really easily. They have got to be incredibly clear about what they're doing or else they're in big trouble. What I'm going to suggest to you, Karen London and I have a hypothesis about the function of play bows. And I, we both feel, this is just a belief, this is a hypothesis, I'm just going to throw it out there for you. My belief is that play bows are not just, not that this isn't important, are not just metacommunication that means everything to come is not meant as it normally would be meant. I also think play bows play a huge role in managing arousal. What do play, what do play bows do? <laughs> What do play bells do? They stop things. They create a pause. And I'm going to talk about the importance of pauses in healthy dog play for the next two hours. I think one of the most important aspects of healthy dog play is pauses, because those pauses allow dogs to manage emotional arousal. And I think one of the biggest problems that people have when they play with dogs is they don't pause, and they work their dogs up and their dogs become over aroused and all of a sudden we have, I went to a fight and a hockey game broke out. <laughs> right? So, let's, you saw this video before. Now look, now look at it from a different perspective. Look at it from the perspective of, of play bows and pauses. And, and, and look at all the pauses, whether they're play bows or not. Play, play, pause. Play, play, play. Play, play, pause. Play, pause. <laughs> Self handicap. He just lay himself down, voluntary down. Here's Willie and Lassie. Not very long ago. Lassie's 15 now. And look who's self-handicapped, by the way. Look who's down on the ground. The stronger one. Pause. Look at him keep himself down. A lot of self-handicapping and a lot of pauses. Hi, Willie. <laughs> okay. So... Here's what I think healthy play needs to include. And then we're going to watch a bunch of videos, OK? I think healthy play often, not always, but if the dogs especially are unfamiliar, you should see a certain number of play bows. I think healthy, healthy you know, a lot of play bows are a great sign of healthy play. Can you have healthy play without play bows? Yes. But usually only if they're familiar. And this is a good time to be anthropomorphic. It's one thing to have your best friend, your partner, your spouse, your child jump on you out of the blue while you're watching television. It's another thing to walk down the street and have a man you've never met before in your entire life grab you and go, Aah! oh, how playful, right? No, not playful. I mean, think of a football game. If people did outside of football games what they did inside of football games, it's a felony. <laughs> Some of the football players have not gotten that distinction. It's quite clear. So, play bows, especially if unfamiliar dogs. Pauses, 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 pauses. You're going to see so many of them, or not, in the videos to come. Exaggerated and lateral movements talked before about how important that rotational locomotor play is. I like to see dogs with open mouths. The more open mouths I see, the more, the more I believe I'm seeing relaxed, comfortable dogs. Dogs start to get either closed, tight, or the commissure is pulled back. 
Then I start thinking about arousal and tension and problems. Ideally, I like to see low, loose tails, but frankly, there's some dogs who never, ever, ever have a low tail. So is it a crisis not to see two low, loose tails? No, but it's nice to see. Um, absolutely need to see some serious self-handicapping. Absolutely critical. If one individual, or well, both individuals are not self-handicapping to the extent that they're not biting and hanging on, you've got to see some self-handicapping, um, which is a kind of emotional control. I want to know the dogs have enough emotional control to, to have bite inhibition, for example. But I don't necessarily care anymore that much about role reversals. I'll talk about a list of unhealthy play in a little bit, but I want to show you now, before we take our next break, let's look at some play sequences, which I would argue to you are healthy play, although I will admit to you this first one, this is Tundra, a Great Pyrenees cross, mostly like nine-tenths Great Pyrenees. Tundra plays with her partner, Bear, quite a bit, but of course, when I went there with my video camera, they had no interest in playing at all, of course. That's, by the way, you know how some trainers name like their leash after them or their method? Well, I have, you are the first to know, I have now coined, and I think I will trademark, the term the McConnell method. <laughs> Here it is. If you have a behavioral problem that you would like to squelch, you buy a video camera and you try to tape it. <laughs> And as long as the batteries are good, <laughs> if the batteries fail, the behavior will occur. <laughs> if you don't know how to use it or it's full, the card is full, the behavior will occur. If you can tape it, it will not happen. It's expensive, eight, nine hundred bucks, put it in your pocket, but then you're done. Okay, so Tundra and Bear did not play, but, but, look what happened. <laughs> Tundra wants to play with me. And watch this great play solicitation. Watch lateral, play bow. There's that rotational locomotor play. Her hindquarters went faster than the rest of her. Watch how lateral she is. Watch how sideways she goes. Good work to Zar. <laughs> She's also doing something called start-stop. We'll talk about that a little bit later, sort of that lunge start-stop. Please. Oh. <laughs> She's not afraid of him. She loves him. That's her guy. I'm getting a great tape of a dog trying to get somebody to play. <laughs> And I was trying to get a tape of two dogs playing. But what a lovely example of play solicitation. Lateral, lateral pauses, lateral, exaggerated movements. It had the whole, the whole shebang. I have never said that in 20 years. The whole <laughs> shebang. This is a videotape from Pia Silvani, bless her heart, from play. And I thought it was the most beautiful video of beautiful, healthy dog play I've ever seen. You're going to see two dogs who have not met each other before, Gwynny and Topper. And, and here's, well, I just, I won't say anything. I'll just play it and then I'll talk over it. I want you to watch pauses, the space between them, how much space there is initially. Look at Gwynny go up. Ah, what are you doing? Excuse me. Now her mouth is open. Uh, she's like, so... Okay. Now look at how much space there is between them. And watch all the pauses. Play bow, play bow, pause. Turn away. See her turn her head away? Oh, I don't know if I want you to look at me straight like that. You're such a big boy. Pause. See how lateral? See how they're going sideways? See how they're closer now? See how they're getting closer and closer? But they started far apart, respecting each other.
Look who's self-handicapping. I'm big and I'm strong. I'm a big, handsome, sexy, turv guy. But I'm going to help self-handicap. Tails are low and loose. Look at that. This is like the perfect gentleman. You just sort of want to date him, don't you? <laughs> He's such a gentleman. He's very handsome. She's pretty cute. He, d he definitely thinks so. Now look how close they are. Look how they completely, ch oh, kissy. And now I'm going to sniff you some more. And that's fine. You can sniff me now. My mouth is open. I have no concern about that. So they're alternating chases. Do you notice? But he's doing the self-handicapping. Notice? Ten over. Oh, person, distraction. And notice who's sniffing who? Does she ever sniff him? No. No. And that's very typical, by the way. The higher status dog does the sniffing. The, <laughs> the lower status dog is the sniffy. Very, very common. I kept, I love the sequence. I got the ball. Now, now he has the ball in his mouth. His mouth is busy. Now she sniffs him. I thought that was very, is that significant? I don't know. Find it pretty interesting. Certainly, they've had a lot of time together now. This has been edited out. And this has been edited. So they've been together now like 15, ooh, nice chin over, huh? I'm handsome. Do you want to go out? <laughs> I know, he's just such a guy. <laughs> just... You see why P is totally in love with him. Yes, lowering his head. I mean, yeah, he's putting him, you know, he's self-handicapping by not always using her power and strength and always being on top of her. So he'll, he'll get over, he'll do chin over, he'll do leg over, but then he self-handicaps. Somebody had a question back there. Yes. So when you say initiating the chase behavior, are you talking the one who runs, or is there an yeah, initiation yeah. from the other partner? Yeah, that's a really good question. It's like, who initiates it? Is the one who starts running away, or the one who's chasing? There's sort of two ways to look at that. One is who initiates it, and that can be the one who's being chased. But also, what I was um, actually thinking about in that context was, who's the chaser and who's the chasee? So sometimes... I think in healthy play, often the chasee is the one who initiates it. They start to run away. Um, but, boy, you know, there probably might be some really subtle things of the one who wants to chase, be the chaser, does something that elicits what looks to us like the initiation. So it's sort of chicken or the egg. But, but they're two different things, and I think it's a really good point. Who initiated it, at least as best we can tell, and who's the chaser and who's the chasee. Okay, isn't that lovely? Isn't that just pretty? So this is also from Pia, very short. Talk about your self-handicapping. Here's your vicious pit bull type, all right? This is why there should be a breed ban. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So who's lying down? Who's constantly not using his power? Oh, my gracious. <laughs> Hello. Don't we all want to talk baby talk now? <laughs> By the way, if someone was measuring your level of oxytocin right now, <laughs> serious, seriously, seriously, it has now elevated. Just watching puppies elevates your oxytocin, which is the social bonding hormone. So when you get all gooey and all sort of weak need, you know, um, that's oxytocin. 
And uh, both men and women have it. Women have it in higher quantities than men, which is not surprising because it mediates lactation. You know, not real shocking. Um, but all social mammals have it. And I suspect that humans and dogs who have really low levels of it are, are sort of those aloof, super aloof. Um, we know that children who have attachment disorder have a dysfunction in their oxytocin receptor system. So it's, it's, it's so all of you who are feeling gooey are like good, normal, oxytocin rich people. Here's another video from Pia. Diet of puppies. You got it. We call this bouncy puppy play, and you will see why. You can turn the sound down a little bit. Look at the little Yorkie poo or whatever. It's the lamb. It's a lamb. Now, here's what's I, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this is it, there, it's just a little black puppy just like, I can do that too. It's fine. It's totally I can. Fine. This is how they're going to learn. What's interesting industry. about this is if, if these were adult dog, dogs, would that be well. appropriate? No. Absolutely, totally. These dogs have never met each other. These puppies have never met. If those were adult dogs, <laughs> that would be totally inappropriate. So one of the things to know about play is it changes. Little tiny puppies do all kinds of things. Those of you who raise litters at, at four weeks, they're just vicious. They grab each other, they shake, they bite. They, that's when they learn bite inhibition. That's when they learn that other puppies won't play with you if you're too rough. This little black puppy is holding his own. But if that, if that, if the bouncy puppy doesn't learn to modulate a little bit, <laughs> cute. I would say that oh, if this, <laughs> you know, imagine if that dog weighed 50 fine. pounds okay. and did that at a dog okay. park. It would be like, okay, that's not okay. So, so what's appropriate and what's inappropriate depends on context, depends on age. And young puppies can do things that are just not inappropriate, that would be inappropriate for adult dogs. There was a question here. You may have answered it, but um, I'm not seeing any pausing going on here like we did with yes. the adult turves. And that's a puppy thing? Yes. More so? Okay. Yes. It's a really good point. Is you see fewer pauses, it's a very good point. You see fewer pauses in young puppies. As they get older and older, you should start to see more and more pauses. So you see more self-handicapping, you see more pausing, you see more play bow. You see any play bows? Uh-uh. So if you watch little young puppies play, they're horrible. They are. They're just terrible. As they, lear as they grow and as they learn, all these things should change. There should be pausing, there should be self-handicapping. Um, and what was the third thing? Pausing, self-handicapping. And yeah, and more play bowing with unfamiliar dogs, especially. Yeah. I was just wondering. So you're talking about how the play advances as they grow to adulthood. Now I could understand if the puppy plays with adult dogs, maybe the adult dogs model appropriate adult play. But if you have a litter that just plays with each other, does this shift happen it nonetheless? It does. It does. So does the shift happen even if it's just a litter playing with each other? It does. Although I would argue. I'm not sure it's healthy to keep a litter of puppies together for like years. Because what I've seen a lot of, now that doesn't happen very often, so I have a tiny sample size. So this is not research, these are just anecdotes. But the puppies I've seen who stayed together, so you get three or four puppies, maybe it's a confirmation breeder, and they have three or four puppies, there seems to be a higher frequency of problems between those puppies than there would be if they were puppies from different litters brought together. I don't know that that's really true, but that's the impression I get. It's just an impression. But yes, they should absolutely start self-modulating as time goes on, even if they're puppies within the same litter, absolutely. Um, here again, you saw some of this before. 
But here again, we have William Lassie. And again, watch the pauses and the self-handicapping. Now we have grown-ups. Now we have the same thing. Lassie, by the way, is almost deaf. She's almost 15. She's almost she's 15 and a half now. She's almost 15 here. She's mostly deaf. She lies are going, uh, but she still loves to play. So again, pausing and self-handicapping. I know you've seen that one already. So here's another litter. Um, this was a litter brought to um, Humane Animal Welfare Society in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Um, you can turn the sound down a little bit. Don't turn it all the way off. The so what I want you to watch here is not just the puppies play, but I want you to watch the playground monitor. <laughs> Mystic, the Border Collie Cross, playground monitor. <laughs> and this is not uncommon at all. Where do I go? And I think some dog, I, you know, why are dogs doing this? Why are dogs playground monitors? I don't know. I think some of them that I've seen actually seem to be distressed by the high level of energy and activity and noise, and it's like, be quiet. I see that especially in herding dogs, Aussies and Border Collies. It's like, stop it, it's just too much. <laughs> just stop it. But I see some nanny dogs, and Mystic to me seems to be a kind of a nanny dog. And again, I'm just guessing. Watch, by the way, watch that Merle, that big, muscly male. This is all one litter, by the way. This is a Cocker Cavalier Cross. All the same litter. All the same age. Well, duh. <laughs> well, duh. Funny how that works together. <laughs> Quite a bit of vertical play. Now, vertical play I find really interesting. People often say high levels of vertical play are problematic. I think that indeed can be true with adult dogs, especially adult dogs who don't know each other. Because who's self-handicapping? If you get two dogs who are both engaging in a lot of vertical play, there's not a lot of self-handicapping. And you awful, often don't see a lot of um, pausing. Again, there's, there are pauses here, though. Play, 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 of course. But it's partly because of Mystic. <laughs> so a little bit, well, there you got, there's the winner, right? If you want to call him that. A lot of mouthing, a lot of rough and tumble play, a lot of bite and shake play, a lot of on top of the other. I would argue in puppies you're seeing more than you would normally see in mature adult dogs. But they're starting to learn to modulate their play. I want to keep this going. Just keep watching this and think about that Merle. Now, now watch this. Who gets the mop? And it's not that he's the only one who cares. Mount, unsuccessful. Never mind. And did you see the little puppy move him, move the other away? And then gave up because Merle Puppy has the mop. It's my mop. And we've all got this all sorted out. We're only 12 weeks old, but it's all sorted out because we've got it all sorted out in play. Right? Okay. So let's take another little break. We're just going to take like a 10 minute break. <laughs> 